Hi, everybody. Well, welcome to what will be the first in a series of seven lectures on the theme of democracy. In the series, we'll be following the presentation of the author and political scientist Jason Brennan uh, in his book, Democracy, A Guided Tour. Uh, that book was recently published by Oxford University Press in 2023, and it is a very fine book. In fact, it is a book that I have looked for for many years. So thank you, Jason Brennan, for writing that book, and I would heartily recommend it to anyone interested in this theme. Um, in the book, Brennan provides a survey, um, both of the history of thinking about democracy, um, but also of the major themes um, that become apparent through that history. So it's not simply a straightforward history, um, but it uh, explores a series of five specific themes, both for and against. Uh, so we'll say more about this in this uh, first lecture of the series, which focuses on Brennan's first chapter, as well as a series of related texts um, that I have paired with it uh, that seem to me essential to understand what we mean uh, by democracy, or uh, maybe I should say uh, things that I have always thought about in connection with democracy, and, and I want to offer for your attention. So let's, let's hop into it. I'm calling this lecture Democracy and Its History, um, given its kind of uh, broad uh, aims. Uh, so let's uh, see what I have collected under that title. Um, as I've mentioned, we're going to be following Brennan's presentation in the book here, and the five themes that he talks about in the book and that he uses to structure his study are indicated there in the first bullet point. Stability, virtue, wisdom, liberty, and equality. Um, and that's what makes the book so very neat to my mind is that a pair of chapters is devoted to each of those five, uh, constituting the bulk of that text. Um, as I say, we're going to be supplementing our study with some primary source readings. Those are things that, that I have assembled, um, in part um, informed by Brennan's text, as, as well as uh, by my own work in this area. And um, at the end of this uh, series, in, in Lecture 7, we'll be looking at two popular scholarly books about the crisis uh, that democracy seems to be facing today. Um, we'll see. Yeah, Brennan refers to this in one of his early chapters as democratic backsliding, and there's quite a lot of discussion about that from various points of view, as, as I need not emphasize, I'm sure, for you, uh, dear listeners. So <clears throat> let's see how Brennan kicks off his text here in chapter one. Democracy, he suggests, is both an obvious idea and a dubious idea. And this is a really, again, neat way to express um, some of the complexities that stretch across the history of debate about this concept. It's an obvious idea because clearly a person should have some say in decisions that are made with respect to themselves. Um, it would seem obvious to most of us today. We would presume that this should be the case in an ideal situation at least. However, throughout most of history, and that goes to our second bullet point here, uh, Brennan emphasizes that democracy was a pejorative term, a negative term, rule of the mob, hoi polloi, as a Greek term, meaning the, the masses, right, the, the great unwashed, uh, that you should, uh, you know, put the people, uh, whatever that is taken to mean, in charge of running the state was seen as dangerous, um, not in, in, to interpret charitably the motivations underlying that, uh, not simply out of elitism or hatred for people who were, who were uh, uneducated or, or had lesser means, um, but because uh, in the operation of a state, it seems reasonable to, to wish that people with expertise in the matter of statecraft should have a greater say than people with no expertise. We would expect the same thing of a doctor or of an engineer or of any other professional. For this reason, going back to the first point, democracy has been seen as quite a dubious idea, an idea um, that really, after the um, experience of democracy in ancient Greece, um, went to sleep <laughs> until uh, the beginning of the modern period and the writings of Machiavelli and, and Hobbes and some of the um, figures of, of the 17th, 16th, and 17th 
centuries. And of course, democracy came back in a big way in the American and French revolutions, as we'll have occasion to discuss later in, in these remarks today. Um, Brennan makes the point that even in countries that are highly undemocratic, at least by the lights of those uh, observers in the West uh, with whom he is in conversation, such as, for example, the People's Republic of North Korea, uh, there is an effort to appear democratic. He refers to Nazi Germany. Um, I've just referred to North Korea. We could think of multiple other regimes around the world, and to, to, to which one might say, and this is across history, thou dost protest too much. Right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying so to establish your democratic credentials that this seems to uh, offer evidence that they are, are in need of being established, that is, that they are not very self-evidently the case. Brennan introduces here, I think, a really helpful uh, three-part um, illustration of different kinds of value. The question he asks is, how do we value democracy? Not whether we should or we shouldn't, but in precisely what way do we value democracy? And he presents the images of a hammer, a painting, and a person. So a hammer is instrumentally useful. A good hammer will hammer a nail. A bad hammer will not hammer a nail. I will value a hammer if it does what it is purported, <laughs> purported to do, what a hammer is supposed to do, as I understand it. Paintings, he suggests, he uses the word symbolic. They have an aesthetic or an artistic kind of value. They, they mean something. They represent something beyond themselves. People, um, following in the tradition of Immanuel Kant and, and many others, we would say, are ends in themselves. that They don't require anything to justify themselves. We simply value a person because they are a person. Um, so in this case, um, he is simply posing the question, uh, which of these three, an instrumental mode of value, a symbolic mode of value, or an uh, deontological, categorical mode of value is most appropriate to how we today think about democracy. And when I'm saying we, I think I'm meaning broadly the uh, constituency of, of scholars and others with whom Brennan, or I, I would take Brennan to be in conversation, including the authors that he refers to throughout his text and professional political scientists, political theorists, um, and ourselves who are engaging with the work of, of those individuals. Now, next in the chapter, <clears throat> you'll have seen, and, and, and it's, I think, a helpful approach, he introduces what he calls the sixth grade model of democracy, uh, broadly speaking. In summary, this model uh, presents democracy as a kind of market or marketplace, maybe. Democracy is a form of trade and exchange by other means. Uh, people know their interests, it is supposed, and democracy enables people to get what they want. So if I want a certain kind of car, or if I want a certain kind of, uh, a certain piece of technology, I know what I'm looking for, and I need simply to be afforded the means to acquire that thing, to get that thing. Uh, what Brennan um, helpfully uh, points out here is that many of the arguments for and against democracy that he will consider in his book have nothing at all to do with this model. This is a simplistic model. Remember, simplistic doesn't just mean simple. It means too simple, overly simple, so simple as to um, cloud the meaning of something rather than illuminate it. So we're Going into the book with this, he suggests, I think fairly, sixth grade model of democracy. We have certain kind of vague ideas about it, you know, a feeling about it. But by looking at the history of it and considering it through the five lenses he'll present, we'll be able to understand it at a greater uh, resolution, a higher resolution in a greater uh, degree of detail. I want to take a look um, just on this in the next slide, and then we're going to go on and look at some of the primary sources that were assigned uh, to, to pair with Brennan's first chapter. Uh, take a look at this definition of democracy, or kind of an extended discussion of it in pursuit of a definition, offered by the philosopher Thomas Cristiano, and we'll be refer returning to Cristiano's work uh, later uh, in the course. Uh, in, in the um, form of a discussion of a selection from one of his books, uh, he seems to be an important figure for Brennan here. Uh, Cristiano writes, and Brennan quotes him in, at length, and I've reproduced his large block quotation on this in the following slide. 
To fix ideas, Cristiano writes, the term democracy refers very generally to a method of group decision-making characterized by a kind of equality among the participants at an essential stage of the collective decision-making, a kind of equality among the participants. Four aspects of this definition should be noted, and I've put in bold his uh, in introduction of each of these four. First, democracy concerns collective decision-making, by which I mean decisions that are made for groups and that are binding on all members of the group. So this is not only decisions imposed upon a group, but made for them, ideally um, by themselves. I would take Cristiano to me. Second, this definition means to cover a lot of different kinds of groups that may be called democratic. So that can be democracy in families, voluntary organizations, economic firms, as well as states and transnational and global organizations. So it's not only figurative to talk about a democracy in non-political contexts. He's using the term democracy to extend beyond certainly electoral politics, but even state or um, international politics into other areas, including civil society. Third, and remember we're looking here at four uh, questions raised by the definition, or four uh, points to be raised. The definition is not intended to carry any normative weight. It is quite compatible with this definition of democracy that it is not desirable to have democracy in some particular context. So the definition of democracy does not settle any normative questions. I think that's a really helpful point. I mean, I suppose if you were to have a class of... I don't know, sixth graders, we've already referred to sixth graders, might as well continue to, to um, <laughs> um, pick on them a bit. Uh, if you have a class of sixth graders, maybe they would all like to go home from school early, or they'd like to not have homework that night, or anything else. Now, certainly, it is important that those sixth graders should recognize and, and be helped to recognize that they do have some agency in the unfolding of, of, of the class and in the activity of learning that is taking place in that class. And of course, there's a lot you could say from the perspective of educational theory about this kind of thing. Um, but it might seem intuitively dangerous for a teacher in that context simply to bow to the will, uh, expressed will of the majority um, in, in all contexts. Fourth, the final point made by Thomas Cristiano, the equality required by the definition of democracy may be more or less deep. The equality may be more or less deep. Um, it may be the mere formal equality of one person, one vote in an election for representatives to an assembly where there is competition among candidates for the position, okay, on the one hand. Or it may be more robust including equality in the processes of deliberation and coalition building. Democracy, he concludes, may refer to any of these political arrangements. It may involve direct participation of members of a society in deciding on the laws and policies of the society, or it may involve the participation of those members in selecting representatives to make the decision. Okay, so we're introduced there in his last sentence to the well-worn and important distinction between a direct democracy and a representative democracy. And we'll have occasion to return to that later in this series when we see the work of John Stuart Mill in his Considerations on Representative Government, where he makes some important observations um, on that point. But I think all four of these uh, points raised by Cristiano help us to see that for Cristiano, um, but also for Brennan, uh, most importantly in this context, democracy is going to mean something more than simply a, a formal method of, uh, of, of carrying out decision-making um, in a national context. It's, it's going to mean um, so apply to a broader sphere. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to say a little bit about the primary source readings that I that I paired with this, and you'll see I've put up on the slide here an image of a course reader that I have assembled um, to pair with these lectures. And I haven't yet decided what's going to happen with that course reader, um, but there it is, and we're going to be looking at at least some passages uh, from the texts excerpted um, in that, that document. The four that we'll look at today are from Pericles, 
Paine, the Declaration of Independence, and Frederick Douglass. Um, you see this is a bit of a grab bag, and, and in fairness, I'm not going to say much about the Declaration of Independence, but I've taught about democracy uh, in this, this course and other courses for a number of years, uh, and these are sources that were not actually explicitly discussed by Brennan uh, in his book. However, it seems to me that these are essential. Some kind of engagement, touch upon these things, is very important um, to, to think about democracy in, in, in the fullest way, according to how I've come to understand that, that task. So I want to say a little bit about Pericles here, and, and that's going to help us to um, connect with, uh, in, in a way, the symbolic point of origin of democracy um, in the West, uh, and, and that is, of course, in ancient Greece, in, in the city-state of, of Athens. Now, when we talk about Athenian democracy, and, and we're getting to Pericles here, who's a, a political figure in Athens who gives a famous speech um, concerning uh, the political culture of that, of that place. Um, when we th talk about ancient Athenian democracy, um, so consider what I have on the slide here. All full citizens of Athens, around 30,000, had the right to attend and vote at meetings of the assembly. So 30,000 people. And the assembly there, the Greek word for that is ecclesia, which is where we get our word ecclesiology and theology, which means the study of the church. Um, this group of, of full citizens, uh, the assembly, made major decisions for the polis. The polis is the city-state itself, and it met every 10 days. Facts for you. Uh, in addition to the assembly, there was a group called the council. Uh, and this consisted of 500 members that had been selected by lot, that is by chance, and they met every single day, and they did most of the hands-on work of actually operating, as it were, the, the institutions of Athenian society. So the council and the assembly here were distinct. And Athenian democracy, Athenian democracy, when we say that, it also included the law courts. And these were effectively juries, uh, people drawn from a pool of 6,000 citizens who had volunteered to serve on those juries. So, so it looks like a pretty robust system of government and, and not utterly uh, different from what we might see uh, today in such countries as the United States. Um, however, uh, as has been widely acknowledged, of course, um, very few of the people who lived in Athens uh, were able to participate in the work of these bodies. Uh, a population of the city was around 300,000, uh, and so that's a far greater number than the numbers we've been working with on the last slide. 100,000 citizens, um, only 30,000 of those were full citizens, um, so the, the person's descent played a role in this, that is, who their ancestors were. Um, also in Athens were 40,000 metics, or uh, so-called so metics, who were resident aliens of the city, uh, living in the city, and 150,000 slaves, 300,000 people. So only about 10% of the actual population of Athens had any say at all in the government, because the other groups just named, not, not to mention women and children in the city, um, had no political voice whatsoever. Uh, democracy in Athens uh, ended in 323 BCE, um, after Athens revolted against its takeover by uh, Macedonia, and um, its form of government was changed. Pericles <clears throat> is coming just a bit before this time of the, the end of Athenian democracy. Athenian democracy is, is relatively speaking, alive and well in his moment. Uh, 495 to 429 BC, those are his, his birth and death dates. He was an Athenian general and an orator. He was known as a, as a powerful speaker. He was leading Athens at the start of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and he was also responsible for establishing Athens' dominant role in what was called the Delian League, a uh, league of Greek city-states in this period of his rules called the Age of Pericles. So the funeral oration that we're, that we're going to look at uh, briefly, we're just going to look at one passage from it, is what he is best known for. This is, appears in the work of the historian Thucydides, uh, the history of the Peloponnesian 
war. Uh, Thucydides um, purports to transcribe what was spoken by Pericles, and there are interesting reasons why it seems likely that he's at least pretty close uh, if you're interested in historical accuracy. Uh, this oration, this speech, was given in 431 BCE, just two years before his own death. It was on the occasion of uh, uh, at the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, when Athens was memorializing and you might say today celebrating the uh, contribution, the sacrifice of soldiers who had died uh, over the previous year. This was an annual ceremony, and Pericles was invited to speak at this ceremony and delivered what is called his funeral oration. So it wasn't a funeral for an individual, it was a funeral for all of those who had, who had perished. Uh, so in his funeral oration, uh, Pericles explicitly acknowledges that Athens is indeed a democracy, but he goes on to describe what Athens looked like to him. Uh, and I've already used the term earlier, but I, I would use it again. He's talking about the political culture of Athens, not, not just its formal institutions, uh, but the way in which people operate uh, within and inhabit those institutions. So we have here from Pericles, um, just a short paragraph uh, that I've pulled out from near the beginning of, of his recorded speech. It reads as follows. While there exists equal justice, that is, in Athens, equal justice to all and alike in their private disputes, the claim of excellence is also recognized. And when a citizen is in any way distinguished, he is preferred to the public service, not as a matter of privilege, but as the reward of merit. So distinction is rewarded on the basis of, of merit. Neither is poverty an obstacle, but a man may benefit his country whatever the obscurity of his condition. Anyone can stand for office. Anyone can ascend to a position of leadership. There is no exclusiveness in our public life and in our private business. We are not suspicious of one another, nor angry with our neighbor if he does what he likes. While we are thus unconstrained in our private business, a spirit of reverence pervades our public acts. So I've posed at the bottom of this quotation just a, a question for your consideration. Are you able to recognize your own society in this description? Clearly, we're looking at an idealized depiction of Athenian society. I mean, already in one of the previous slides, we have reason to doubt the, the overall justice of the of the circumstances in Athens of Pericles' time. But he is giving expression in a way that would do much to inspire uh, later uh, leaders and theorists to a vision of society uh, that has come to be associated, I, it seems to me, and I would argue, with democracy, with democracy in that broader kind of political culture sense um, that I've uh, perhaps suggested, uh, and certainly meant to suggest Brennan was adopting. Now, <clears throat> jumping ahead, <laughs> jumping ahead, uh, I don't know, 2,000 years, say a little bit about Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine is, is, to my mind, unjustly forgotten. Without Thomas Paine, it's always seemed to me doubtful that there would have been an American revolution, for, for better or for worse, I, I myself would say, for, for the worse. It seems good that 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 event occurred. Um, he was born in 1737, died in 1809, um, and I've helped myself to the characterization presented there in the first bullet point. He was a kind of 18th century Socrates. Um, he was a man of the people. He was an emphatic commoner, and he was despised by most elites. Thomas Paine uh, did not play, well, he did play political games, but but only in the pursuit of truth or justice as he understood it. He was, a, he was an almost naive man of principle, uh, if, if that is a fair characterization, I would hazard it is. He was never tied to any political party, mostly self-educated. He knew the British army. He'd been in the Navy, the British military, and how it operated. 
Um, when he died at the end of a, a long career, and I'll comment briefly on his role in the American and in the French revolutions, uh, he died in 1809 in Greenwich Village in New York City. He was broke and forgotten. There were only six people present at his funeral, and two of them were black, were African Americans. Um, and so we see in Thomas Paine um, already, just from this brief sketch, someone who was indeed uh, a founding figure um, of the country, or maybe that hasn't yet entirely been established, but that's where we're going, um, but yet someone who was always a little bit on the outside of that, of the, the broader historical movement, not fully recognized as a founding father by his fellow founding fathers. <clears throat> In America, and that is in what would be the United States, Thomas Paine published Common Sense just 15 months after arriving in the country in, in the year 1776. Um, and he is considered by many to be the moral author of the Declaration of Independence. And that's how we're getting uh, by with not commenting directly on the Declaration of Independence, which is nonetheless associated with this set of primary source readings. Uh, because what Paine says, I think you'll see in, to in Common Sense, basically lays the groundwork for the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he, he said, hey guys, Let's write a Declaration of Independence. Here are the reasons why we ought to do that. And then lo and behold, uh, it is done. Uh, slavery, um, he had a position on this. He was, he was ardently opposed to it. Um, he tried to get a clause forbidding the slave trade in the Declaration of Independence itself. Thomas Jefferson did, in fact, draft such a clause. It was not included for, for reasons that would be fought out at, at great and, and significant length, of course, in later decades. Oh, there we have my keyboard. And he even, Thomas Paine, suggested the purchase of, uh, suggested the uh, Louisiana Purchase to Thomas Jefferson in the hopes that these new territories would not have slavery. That, that didn't work out like many of Thomas Paine's uh, ambitions for the United States of America, a term that he himself was, was the first to use. Thomas Paine, <clears throat> after the American Revolution, traveled to France, and he was one of only two foreign delegates to the National Convention uh, in France. Um, after the Revolution, he received the keys to the Bastille as the great prison in the center of Paris, which was destroyed. He received these keys as a gift. Um, he gave those keys to George Washington um, as he regifted them. Uh, and he later became, however, a strong critic of, of George Washington, uh, and this lost him a lot of friends and allies in, in the United States. So he was very much active between U.S. and um, the, the emerging United States and France. Um, he was opposed to the killing of Louis XVI, that is, the, by guillotine, uh, the king of France, uh, and also to the use of the guillotine generally in this earned him the ire of the, the Jacobins, the radical party in the French Revolution. And he narrowly escaped death. This is a funny story. It might be apocryphal, but I, I like it. He was imprisoned, and um, someone came by to mark the doors of uh, those to be executed the following morning. However, Payne's door, I forget if it was open when it should have been closed or closed when it should have been open, but somehow... Uh, the mark didn't get put on the right side of the door, and he was thus not taken out the next day to be executed, and he thus lived uh, for more than a decade uh, or two beyond that. Payne was, quote, revolutionary within both the American and the French revolutions. Now, in, in future in this series, I should point out, I won't be offering quite such extensive comments, although I'm tempted to do so, because uh, certainly in the case of Thomas Paine, there's a feeling of redressing a wrong in a way that, that people are so unaware of his his contribution. But I would take a look now briefly at just the, uh, my computer is acting up here, uh, just the quotation that I've pulled out of his pamphlet, Common Sense, which, by the way, was distributed by George Washington to his troops in 1776 to drum up support for the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Paine, in this book, Common Sense, uh, goes back to, uh, like earlier authors, a kind of imagined state of nature, a beginning of human uh, intercourse, of human um, uh, common endeavor. 
And rather, however, than um, identify government as the point of origin of that, he identifies something called society. Society came first, and then government uh, emerged later uh, as a kind of necessary evil. Uh, we were doing okay with society uh, and, until circumstances were such that we needed something else called government. So let's take a look um, at this at this passage, and I, I think I can't turn that off. So, Payne writes, Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, society and government. Whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants, and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one, society, encourages intercourse, that is, uh, exchange and conversation with others. The other creates distinctions. The first, society, is a patron. The last, government, is a punisher. And as you read on in Common Sense, he tells a story, kind of weaves a tale, a mythical tale, of how it came to be that government, and especially the rule of kings, to which he is especially opposed, um, how it came to be that that emerged um, on, on top of society. And the key here, it would seem to me, and has always so seemed, uh, would be that once you establish that there's a possibility of organized human co endeavor, cooperation, um, beneath government, then it is possible to, as John Locke would have us do, exit from government and return to society, talk about what kind of government we want to have, and then come back and set up a new government, right? So it gives you a, a degree of flexibility that, you know, older ideas, uh, divine right of kings or something like that, um, does not afford you. You can't, you can't take time out from your divinely appointed monarch uh, if, you, if you see it that way in order to think of some other arrangements. So Thomas Paine, a revolutionary within the great revolutions of that time. Our final author, and the last text I'd like briefly to comment on is uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, astonishing, powerful speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? That's the title. You see the title on, on the book depicted on the slide there. Frederick Douglass, of course, a thinker of the 19th century, a writer, an orator, a reformer, an activist, uh, an outstanding uh, personality and thinker, was born into slavery in Maryland. He escaped from that state and became the author of the book Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass, as well as many other, um, I've used the word here, galvanizing works. Um, among them, um, perhaps near the forefront of them is this text, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. This was delivered on July 5th, 1852. July 5th, 1852. And Douglas there has been invited in Rochester, New York, to speak to a society of abolitionists, that is, um, fellow travelers, fellow workers, comrades in arms, right? I mean, these are people who are on his side. It's very important when you look at the speech to keep that in mind. These are not people who disagree with Douglas, at least uh, at least not uh, to their own knowledge. Uh, what, what Douglas does here uh, is worth far more extended comment uh, than, than we'll be able to provide for it in this context. But I would recommend the speech to, to any hearer of my words here, because uh, the what to the slave of the is the Fourth of July, um, is is at the at the basis of uh, rethinking uh, what the United States is, <laughs> who are Americans, what unites us as a country, what divides us as a country, and how can our own hypocrisy and blindness um, cause us. To, to not see or refuse to see certain injustices happening directly before our eyes. Uh, he acknowledges at the beginning of the speech that the founders of the country were, were great men, um, but he laments that the greatness that they 
that they exhibited in, in fighting for the principles they did uh, is, is not being carried forward in his own day. That In 1852, and just think about the time this was delivered, the United States was living in, I think he says at one point, the rankest of hypocrisy. Uh, what I would recommend to your attention here, as we continue with our little technical difficulties, uh, in this speech, and this is the passage, uh, friends, that has always stood out most to me in this in this speech, and, and I wonder what you think of it. At a time like this, scorching irony, this is Frederick Douglass, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. For this passage, he's he's gone through, do you want me to argue that, you know, African Americans are not human? Uh, or do, do you want me to give you an argument that they're human? Do you want me to give you an argument that they're that they have dignity? Uh, they're rational. But, uh, no, no argument is needed for that. I mean, his, his hearers are abolitionists. They agree with all these principles, but they continue to do nothing. Right? So when all arguments have failed, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled and the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. Its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced, full stop. So what are we saying here? We're saying if all argument is not only um, unnecessary, but pointless and insulting, then rhetoric and, as he puts it here, irony, scorching irony, might be the way to bring about an awareness of truth and the reality of, of justice. So I've, again, helped myself to the opportunity to pose a question here at the bottom of the slide. Is it true today that scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed? It seems to me there's a lot one could say about that question in our present moment. And that, friends, I don't know what that, never had a technical difficulty like that before. All right, friends, that concludes lecture one in the series of seven lectures. I will see you next time where we will discuss whether democracies are more stable than other forms of social organization.